Hello everybody, welcome back to Day Today Chess. I've received some good feedback. Um, people were happy at me coming back to my YouTube channel and I definitely want to continue doing this. I love promoting chess in general and of course if I can share some, some of my good um, games with you guys, I'll certainly do so. Um, um, I um, received some comments about trying to analyze some um, more of my games from the US Championship, which I'm planning on doing in the future. However, uh, kind of following up with the same path um, from my game that I showed yesterday against Agata Bukotsev, which um, I hope uh, if you haven't seen yet, you will um, go back to my videos and check it out. I've seen a very beautiful game played by former world champion Vladimir Kramnik against Anan Syujirov in the Russian um, uh, team championship, um, which everybody knows is one of the strongest team uh, um, championships um, in the world, probably. And um, I really enjoyed the game because... I thought it was kind of going hand in hand with my game. Obviously, I am. I would be. It would be too much to compare myself with uh, uh, Vladimir Kramnik, but I, I feel that um, he, if I had seen his game before playing mine, I would get inspired. And he's the type of player that sometimes it might feel like he doesn't do very much, but he works on improving his position. And um, he tries to utilize every little advantage that he gets in a position to um, to convert that game into a win. And so, um, if you haven't seen this game yet, um, I, I definitely recommend you watching the video. If you have seen the game, hopefully you can still enjoy some of my comments. So, uh, he started with F, knight f3 and e3, which, you know, you don't often see... Um, being played because I mean if you want to play d4 you're gonna go for d4 the first move right but sometimes you're learning things to unlearn them so although when you start playing chess you're thinking you're being taught that it's very important to occupy the center with your pawns sometimes you might want to allow your uh, opponent to occupy the center first so that you can choose later what type of system you want to play and how you want to break through their center and that's exactly what uh, Vladimir Kramnik has done in this game. He went for knight f3 first, then e3, and now he's ready to play d4. And after knight f6, he went for it, d4. So this um, sometimes can avoid some um, other setups for black. And if you're unsure what your opponent is going to do, playing knight f3 kind of, um, you know, can get the types of positions that you might want, but also you can get into positions that you don't want. So it's uh, it's really a matter of preference. And uh, Vladimir Kramnik shows us in this game how sometimes you can go from something that seems um, maybe more on the defensive side or trying to play like black into playing a game um, quite actively as white. And so now Sujirov went for g6 in this position allowing d5, which Kramnik went for immediately. Now, uh, what's going on in this position? We basically start having a Benoni setup, but a type of Benoni where white already played e3, so if later they are going to play e4, they basically lost the tempo, so it should be in black's favor. What white can do, though, in these types of positions, notice compared to a regular Benoni, which, of course, would go this way, Knight f6, c4, c5, d5. Um, now th the pawn is in c4. However, in the game after bishop um, g7, this pawn has not been placed in c4 yet. And for some of you who are playing d4, you might know that a very typical idea for white to do against the Benoni is to utilize the c4 square. Well, of course, when you have a pawn there, you need to wait for black to play e6, trade in d5, and then bring your knight towards c4 to kind of stabilize the position on the queen side. Here, however, not having played c4 is actually to white's benefit because 
there's no need to play c4 to strengthen that pawn in d5 since anyways it's going to be traded so uh, white can just play knight c3 which is exactly what Kramnik did so now that pawn in d5 is protected enough and we can utilize the c4 um, square as an outpost for our bishop or knight castle and Vladimir Kramnik went for bishop c4 now, um, you might think the bishop doesn't do very much in c4 because there's a pawn that blocks it, but uh, do not worry. In order for black to get some kind of play, they have to play e6 eventually, and then when these pawns are going to be traded, this bishop is going to be doing a great job in c4. So, um, why does black have to play e6? Well, white has more space for the moment with this pawn in d5, and it doesn't seem like you can play a6, b5, because any time you're going to be playing a6, white is going to play a4, stop you from playing b5. Sometimes a5 is played as well to, to um, you know, stabilize the position to make sure you never get to keep your pawn in b5, because I'll take en passant. And um, black has no other play. Uh, if you don't do much, I'll of course finish my development by castling, and then I can consider e4, e5 you know, and just pushing the center forward. This is the big thing of having a center. You don't just have a center and do nothing with it. You have the center, you control more squares um, slowly to, in your uh, opponent's territory, and then you keep pushing the pawns to get even more and more and restrict your opponent more and more. This is kind of what white does in, uh, in d4 openings. So Kramnik played bishop c4. In this position, uh, there has been a game played um, actually um, in 2015 by um, Alexander Shabalov with bishop e2. And after e6, white went for e4, um, trying to maintain this pawn in d5. But I think I like... Um, I like Kramnik's approach a little bit more. Bishop e2 is definitely um, a good continuation for white, but okay. Maybe because, uh, maybe I'm being biased here because I really like uh, Kramnik's play, so we'll see. Anyways, d6, and uh, white castle, very natural finishing up the development. Of course, h3 is another possibility if you're worried about bishop g4 and um, losing your knight in f3. But just think about it. Why would you have to worry about that bishop g4? Whenever they play bishop g4, that's the moment that you can chase that bishop away. It's not going to go to h5, rest assured. Uh, it's probably going to be either um, retreating or capturing in f3. And then you just won the bishop pair. And any time the position will open up, suddenly you will have the bishop pair um, definitely in your favor. So... Often players worry about this bishop g4, but rest assured, it's not um, that big of a deal for white. Okay, so now that we finished this side of the um, board, we definitely need to do something about this bishop in c1. And, you know, b3, bishop b2 doesn't look very nice. We might be losing some material after knight e4. So e4 is definitely in the plan. And I was mentioning to you earlier that White did lose a move by playing e3 and now e4, but he also doesn't have the pawn in c4, so he basically saved us, uh, saved himself some time um, now utilizing the square for a piece instead. e6, right? And here, White went for rook e1. There, a file could potentially be opened uh, after capture. And uh, this, uh, we definitely want to capture back with a piece in d5. So we want to make sure our pawn in e4 is going to be well protected. Black needs to do something in the center, otherwise they're really crammed up. So pawn takes d5, and of course, like I mentioned to you earlier, we want to keep a piece in d5. Now, um, is this trade possible? You have to ask yourself, because you're basically leaving a pawn hanging there, right? So the answer is no, this would be a blunder for black because after knight takes e4, we've got a really nice move, knight to g5. And uh, we're going to utilize this pin. Are you going to take in g5? 
Well, go ahead. Bishop takes. Um, now you, as you notice, black is not well developed, so they have to do something about their rook. Queen takes. And now if they take the bishop, what do we do? Well, we have a lot of alternatives. This is one of them, and then we can capture the bishop. We also have alternatives in other um, variations of playing um, knight c7 here. Of course, it wouldn't be good, but just keep in mind that that would be an opportunity. So, for example, here, um, let's say oh, black would go knight f6. We can, again, capture bishop takes f7. So, I mean, there are many ways for white to win. Um, so, knight takes e4 would be definitely a blunder. Okay, so Sujirov decided to play knight c6 to finish their development because once that pawn got away from there, maybe he did create a weakness, maybe he did give away the d5 square, but at least he got the square c6 to develop the knight. And in most Benonis, when this pawn is in c4, black would have the d4 outpost for their knight. However, here it is not an outpost anymore. Keep in mind the pawn is in c2, so white can always play c3. Let's finish up our development. Bishop e6. c3, just to make sure that knight is not going to get to d4. Bishop takes d5. Trying to get away that piece from d5 because it's really annoying. And here, finally, exiting the spin with queen c7. And this is something that I learned um, as a kid as soon as I understood what an outpost meant. And um, I definitely want to pass that along. And I want you to remember that when there is an outpost in the position and you know for sure that you can keep it there forever, you know you have two bishops and you know the outpost certainly has one color so not both of your bishops are going to be able to utilize that square so in that case it is totally fine and acceptable and in fact it's recommended for you to give away the bishop that does not control that square on a piece that does control it and in fact the best way is to actually trade it for a knight so this is exactly what Kramnik did. Capture the knight, and now he will be sure to remain with an outpost here in d5, because anytime you bring the knight to trade it, I'll probably take back with the queen, and then I will make sure that my knight is going to get to d5 ASAP. So I'll always have a piece on that outpost. Very, very important. And now we look at this position, and we realize that it might look quite equal. I mean... Um, besides that outpost, why doesn't have very much? But that's exactly what we're looking for to get in a position. A slight advantage that we can slowly improve and convert to something bigger and bigger that's finally going to happen um, and help us win the game. So, what shall we do in the position? Well, we definitely need to uh, recycle this knight and bring it slowly towards a square that's going to control the d5 square. So, knight d2. Rook to d8. Queen b3. I mean, we need to finish up our development. And it's nice to keep the queen attacking both f7 and uh, mb7. a6. Finally, black gets ready to play b5. What do we do in this case? Immediately a4. Any time in Banoni type positions, when your opponent wants to play b5, get more space on the queen side and start pushing their pawns, this is the best move to stop that from happening. Now Sujirov went back rook b8, thinking I'm going to play b5 anyways. Uh, but knight c4. I'm not worried about b5 in this position. If black plays b5, how do we react? Why is this move so great? Probably just sacrificing d6. And after queen takes d6, bishop takes f7, king moves, now we can take. And uh, b5 is going to be hanging um, later as well. Or if you play c4 intermediate move, then it's okay to trade queens because we're doing much better. Rook takes e8, we capture here. And now it may seem that we don't have that much. Black has 
two pieces for the rook, but the rook and two pawns, and the rook also can get active either d6 or d7, and um, b5 is weak, and it's going to be captured most likely, so this position is almost winning for white. Okay, so let's go back to knight c4. So Jirov decided, let me try to trade the knights, because if I do trade the knights, then it will be opposite color bishops, and maybe I have a big chance to make a draw, you know. So um, here, uh, uh, Kramnik could have kept his knight and played knight b6, utilized that other outpost that has been created in the position, but um, he preferred instead to... Um, play a5 and say look I want to put my knight to b6 but I want first want to play a5 and see maybe you're going to trade in c4 and you might uh, you might do that because you think that opposite color bishops is going to be draw so you know I'll just let you do it because I think I'm much better in the position I'm utilizing the pawn structure as an advantage and um, I, you know, I, I definitely want to use that more than I want to keep my knight. So feel free to trade it. And that's exactly what happened. Queen takes. And that one is really uh, going to be an issue for black because they have to stay and protect it. And so Sujirov decided that no, he doesn't want to stay and protect it and play b5 to try to get some play on the b file because it was obvious white is going to capture. But now, you know, this pawn is weak, but white also has the b2. So if bl black captures b2, that bishop will get active, maybe capture c3 at some point. Black has no big problems. But of course, we don't give away this pawn. We want to get the a6 pawn without giving counterplay to the opponent. So rook e2, rook b8, finally getting some play, rook a2. And here... You may think that, okay, white has become passive, suddenly protected b2, how are they going to win a6? Well, there are two sides uh, on a chessboard. The queen side, where of course there's a big weakness in a6, but there's the king side as well. And white can consider attacking ideas by playing f4, um, then... Um, the rook would come to, to f2 if you think about it, and slowly push the pawns on the king side to improve um, their um, space advantage. And black seems to be stuck, because although they are attacking b2, they are kind of stuck there, whereas I can improve a little bit on the king side. And you will have to stay to protect the f7 pawn as well, so white's uh, position can improve slowly, whereas black's is kind of stuck, and you won't really think about it that way because I mean material is equal um, opposite color bishops you know what what can happen well things can happen because there are more pieces on the board and a potential attack for white is on the way so uh, Sujirov played rook b5 saying oh, maybe you're gonna take an a6 so that I can get active but not yet my king stays on mate on first rank so we want to make sure that's not going to be an issue anymore. G G3. It's always a nice move. And notice, white puts their pawns on the same color as black's bishop to restrict that bishop as much as possible. And now uh, Kramnik thought it was time to actually make the trade. You have to get a little bit active. Um, so, rook takes. Rook takes b2. Rook takes b2, rook takes b2. Okay, now we've got the a-file, but we cannot do anything on the 8th rank. We definitely need to get active on the 7th, right? 8-7. Um, and also the bishop controls b7, so this rook cannot return. That's why we need our queen, queen a4. Now the rook has a threat to come to a7. Queen d8, just trying to avoid to allow queen a7, rook a7 with tempo, but rook a7 was played anyways little thread there. Bishop e7 is the only move. And now, how do we continue? How do we improve the position? Well, we need to restrict black as much as possible. Rook d7. What I love about this game is that it's just restriction, restriction, and it seems like everything is protected, yet um, it's not really that way. 
Queen e8, what to do? Well, the seventh rank is your big issue. You went for, for the b2 pawn, but you allowed white very, very active. Queen a7, very nice move. The only move is king f8. You really cannot move the bishop because this f7 pawn would be hanging. And now king g2. Just, you know, I would say a type of prophylactic move, although you, you don't have anything specific in mind. It's more like a Tsuzvan type of position. Let's see what you're doing. I'm just improving my, uh, my king's uh, position just to make sure you won't have any checks. Uh, I'm on white square. I'm well protected. There's nothing. So, Sujir of h6. Already. Let's look at that queen which is really trapped there. Maybe we can trap it even more. Bishop c6. Now that the bishop went away from the c7 square, now this bishop can finally move. Bishop g5. But unfortunately, it won't. Black won't survive for much longer because after rook c7, queen went to e6. What was Kramnik's last move? Return to that amazing outpost d5 that we've, you know, we've emphasized on throughout the entire game, and now f7 is falling and white is winning. So, very important to learn from this game that every little advantage can help you improve it more and more and give you uh, more advantages. And don't think that opposite color bishops mean that you're actually going to have uh, the chance to make a draw in a game. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this game. I certainly did. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow with the next um, another YouTube channel video. Thank you. Bye.